cards will go through a lot of iterations, right? And numbers change all the time. Sometimes they change in the middle of games, right? I've literally had playtest games where like I cast a spell, we talk about it for a minute, decide this is crazy, change one of the numbers as the spell is resolving. Things happen quick here, you gotta keep up. Hi, I'm Matt Tabak. I'm an editor and game designer with Wizards of the Coast, and this is Magic the Gathering Support. At Joseph Bell CC, you have tweeted to me, I have a legitimate question. And again, this is good. You should always be upfront that your question is legitimate, so I take it seriously. Why does everyone hate mono white so much in Magic the Gathering? I yearn to know the answer. Or is this just some in-joke that I'm too stupid to get? I don't think everyone hates mono white. One of the cool things about magic is there are a lot of strategies, right? There are a lot of things you can do. Some are very aggressive creature-based rush decks. You have combo decks that kind of aim to finish off your opponent in one turn. You have ones that are based on casting instants and sorceries, ones that are creature-based, ones that feature lots of planeswalkers, ones that feature no planeswalkers. So there's a million strategies out there and everyone has their favorites and their least favorites. Especially if you run into a kind of deck that you lose to all the time, that can easily become your least favorite. Cool thing that magic lets you do is kind of change your strategy, right? A good way to get better is to pay attention to what you're losing to. And I know most of the time it's just stupid luck and I hate everything, but if you move past that and look at what actually your opponent did or what you didn't do during a game, this is the key to getting better. Recognizing that a wide variety of strategies are viable, a wide variety of counter strategies are viable, and that's how you become a more successful Magic player. Is this some in-joke? I don't think it's an in-joke. I think uh, it's popular to hate on successful strategies and Mono White has historically been a successful strategy. It's had its ups and downs like everything. Are you too stupid to get it? I haven't met you. I don't know, it's possible. I don't think it is. And the fact that you play magic is a pretty strong indicator that you're not too stupid. So I think you're doing okay, Joseph, and uh, thank you for your question. All right, Shep in Training asks, random Magic the Gathering question. If you attack with a 2-2 creature and are blocked by a 2-2 creature, which creature or creatures are destroyed? Let's talk about combat. Okay, this is kind of the essence of the game, right? Creatures battling each other. Every creature has two important stats when it comes to combat. The first number to the left of the slash is its power, and that tells you how much damage the creature deals. And the second number after the slash, that's its toughness. It tells you if a creature is dealt that much damage in one turn, it's destroyed. So when creatures fight or when creatures battle in combat, what's gonna happen is each creature is gonna deal damage equal to its power to the other one, and that's gonna happen at the same time. So in your example, you got two two twos battling it out. Let's call them A and B, just to creatively name the creatures. Creature A is gonna deal two damage because its power is two to creature B. Creature B is gonna deal two damage because that's its power to creature A. Both of them take two damage to be destroyed. That's their toughness. So in your example, both creatures are destroyed. All right, let's check out our next question from Friar Tug of Resist the Idiocracy. At Wizards Magic, question, opponent casts Act of Treason. In response, I cast Heroic Intervention. In response, Op casts Lightning Bolt. Stack resolves. Three damage to creature with three toughness. Creature gains indestructible and hexproof. Act of Treason fizzles. Does the creature die? Friar Tug, first of all, thank you for sending your question in the form of a haiku. That makes it just more entertaining for me. Unfortunately, I, I don't think I can answer in the form of a haiku. Um, I will, however, answer this question involving the stack and how things resolve using interpretive dance. Act of treason. Heroic intervention. Lightning bolt. So what happens is things are going to resolve top to bottom. The last spell or ability cast. Uh, is going to resolve first. So, Lightning Bolt is going to resolve first. It's going to deal three damage to a creature with three toughness. Now, right away, that creature is going to be destroyed. This is going to happen before Heroic Intervention resolves. So, there are rules in the game called state-based actions. And what these do, they're kind of like the janitors of magic, right? They come through and they clean up any situation that needs cleaning up. So, after any spell or ability resolves, the game is checked to see is there a creature with lethal damage still on the battlefield? Is there a creature with zero toughness hanging out on the battlefield? And if so, it's gonna clean it up and get it off the, off the battlefield. So after Lightning Bolt resolves, 
the creature is destroyed before the other two spells get a chance to resolve. So Heroic Intervention will still resolve and give permanence, you control, indestructible, and hexproof, but the creature that was destroyed by the lightning bolt is no longer there. The Act of Treason will also not resolve because its target is now sitting in the graveyard. And I hope what I have done here, Friar Tug, clears things up for you. Okay, let's check out another question, this time from at the Seraphman. Question for MTG Twitter. That's me. Uh, does anyone remember any other specific card nicknames? The ones I got are Bob, Gary, Skittles, and Mom. But I know there's more I'm forgetting. There are, in fact, a lot more that you may be forgetting. Of course, Bob is Dark Confidant. It was given that nickname because the art, the original art of Dark Confidant was an image of Bob Marr, pro player that won the Magic Invitational, which was an event. The prize for that was to get his likeness on a Magic card. Gary, of course, is the Grey Merchant of Ashvidel. Skittles is Skitherix the Blight Dragon, and Mom is Mother of Runes. So these are you know, nicknames for cards that have developed over the years. Probably the most popular nickname of all time for a Magic card is Tim for Prodigal Sorcerer. This is, of course, a creature that tapped to deal damage, uh, given the nickname Tim, based on its kind of likeness to a uh, wizard and Monty Python, so they call me Tim. Uh, this spawned, of course, Tim on a stick, Tim on a boat, basically anything that tapped to deal one damage got a Tim-related nickname. Some older cards have nicknames. Uh, Hypnotic Spectre is Hippie. There were the Pump Knights, Two white, two black knights, Order of Laetbor, and a couple others that had uh, abilities that where you could pump uh, mana into them to increase their power. So those were collectively called the Pump Knights. Uh, there are a lot. Yeah, do some Google searching. There, there are quite a few out there. Some not super appropriate for this video. And we're just gonna end uh, this question on that one. All right, Christian Calligraphy Corner asks, to all Magic the Gathering plays. I'm a play. Let's see what the question is. Question of the day. Are there any mono red creature cards that work only if you have a snow covered mountain? Comment below. Now, some of you may be watching this video and you're looking to get into magic and you don't know all the terms yet. So you're like, what are, what is mana? What is lands? What, what's he talking about? So mana is basically the system of energy that we use in the game. So it's kind of a resource system. A game of magic is all about is, you know, wizards casting spells. And to cast those spells, you need to have enough energy to do it. And that's called mana. The very Easiest way to get mana is through your lands. Each turn you play one land from your hand onto the battlefield, and it's kind of a land you have and you control it, and you can tap that land, which means, you know, turn it, kind of indicate that it's used for the turn. And that gives you the energy that you need, the mana you need to be able to do other things in the game, like summon creatures, cast spells, activate abilities, kind of do things to interact with your opponent and further your goal of beating that opponent. My search didn't turn up any cards that, uh, any red creature cards that work only if you have a snow-covered mountain. There are gonna be a lot of creatures out there that get better if you have a snow-covered mountain. So for example, Oran Yeti, that can give your creatures first strike. So look for cards that require snow mana of some kind, or ones that care about having snow uh, lands on the battlefield. So none that you need, but there are definitely some ones out there that get better. And our next question is from Yuli Bambuli. Blazing Archon is our card of the day because I have a legality question. All right, hit me. Creatures can't attack you. Check. So does that mean me as a planeswalker directly or in general, they cannot not attack unless targeting a specific creature? All right, Bambuli Yuli, um, let's get a couple things straight just to make sure we're all on the same page here. While creatively and in some of our marketing, we kind of sell that you, the player, are a planeswalker, that's, that's a thing. In the game, it's important to note that you are a player and planeswalkers, the cards, are the only things that are planeswalkers. So when you attack, you don't attack creatures directly. When I'm saying I control a creature and I'm gonna attack you, what I'm doing is I'm basically just sending the creature in your direction. I'm saying it's either gonna attack you or it's gonna attack a planeswalker you control. I can't attack your creatures directly. What you can do as the defender is decide how your creatures are gonna block my creature or if they're gonna block it. So as the defender, you kind of have active control over how combat is gonna go. You're gonna decide whether my attacking creature gets blocked or not, and if it is blocked, by which creature. So I can't attack your creatures directly. So if an effect says I can't attack you, that means exactly that, it can't attack you. It can still attack a planeswalker you control unless the effect says, will specifically say if you can't. 
But Blazing Archon doesn't say that because Blazing Archon is from a time before Planeswalkers. So it just can't attack you. Your Planeswalkers are fair game. Your creatures can never be attacked, Blazing Archon or no. I hope this helps. All right, we have a question from Elder Cleric who says, at Wizards Magic, I have a judge question. If you attack with a Colonnade or a Nissa land, mobilize district, can I tap it for mana during combat and keep it in combat? Okay, so what Elder Cleric is asking about is cards like uh, Celestial Colonnade, Mobilize District, and then the character Nissa, one of her kind of, uh, in her power suite is she turns lands into creatures. So we're talking about cards that turn lands into creatures, which presumably you then smash face with. So the basic rule is this. There's a rule called Summoning Sickness, which says a creature cannot attack or tap for any of its abilities that use the tap symbol, unless you've controlled it from the beginning of your most recent turn. So the question is, if I have a land and I turn it into a creature, can it then attack? A lot of these turn the land into a creature with haste. So you get to ignore Summoning Sickness completely. Haste is an ability that says, as soon as I hit the battlefield on my turn, I can attack. I can use my tap abilities, no problem. If the land entered the battlefield under your control that turn, and you then turn it into a creature, it hasn't been under your control since the beginning of the turn. So in that case, once it becomes a creature, it can't attack that turn, and it can't be tapped for mana that turn, unless again, it has haste. If you turn a land that you've controlled for the entire turn, you turn it into a creature, that new creature can attack because the rule doesn't care whether it's been a creature or not. It only cares how long you've controlled that permanent. So as long as you controlled it from the beginning of your turn until now, it can attack and it can tap for mana if it's a creature. Now, can you keep it in combat? If the land attacks, most of the time it's gonna become tapped. So you can't also tap it for mana, but if the land has Vigilance, which is an ability that lets you attack without becoming tapped, you'll be an attacking creature that's untapped. And then you can tap for mana. So yes, you can do both if you have Vigilance. Hope this helps. Let's go to our next question from at Thiefs underscore Magic. A question for at Wizards underscore Magic. Wait, are we related? Are we like cousins or something? That's wild. That's our last name. How does Changeling Tribal work with Coat of Arms? Help me out here. All right, Thieves Magic, a great question. Coat of Arms, uh, historically a very popular card, but sometimes misunderstood. What Coat of Arms says is that each creature on the battlefield gets plus one, plus one for each other creature that shares a creature type with it. Now, Coat of Arms doesn't really care how many creature types you share with another creature. So if you have two goblins on the battlefield, they'll see each other and say, hey, I'm a goblin, you're a goblin, let's each get plus one, plus one. If I have a changeling on the battlefield, now changeling is an ability that says a creature is every creature type. So it's a goblin, it's an elf, it's a dragon, it's a wizard, it's a coward, it's a drag. it's like 180 of these things. It's everything. If it sees a goblin on the battlefield, it says, I'm a goblin, you're a goblin, let's each get plus one plus one. If there's two changelings on the battlefield, they say, I'm everything, you're also everything. They each oh, still only get plus one plus one because it's the number of creatures that share a creature type, not the number of creature types. Moving on to our next question. It comes in from at one sacred seraph. I have a Magic the Gathering question. If a person has a hand with no lands and no cards that can be played, can they burn their hand at wizards underscore magic? Couple things I wanna talk about here with this question. So the first is mulligans. At the beginning of the game, you draw seven cards. Now, for any reason, if you don't like those seven cards, if you have too many lands, if you have not enough lands, if you've built your deck around a particular strategy and your important cards aren't there, whatever. If you don't like what you see, you can shuffle it back into your library draw another seven, see if you like those. Now, when you're done, as many times as you've shuffled your hand back in, you have to take that many cards from your hand and put it on the bottom of your library. So if I mulligan once, I'm gonna start the game with a six card hand. That's kind of the balancing factor. I get another shot to get what I want, but I lose a card in the process. And if I mulligan again, then I'm gonna draw seven and say, okay, these seven I like, I need to take two cards and put them on the bottom of your library. So however many times you shuffle back in, that's how many cards you're gonna lose before you actually start the game. So that's 
a mulligan system that lets you sort of have a little bit more control over your opening hands. Make sure you get something you're happy with so the game plays out well for you. What you might be talking about in your question is there used to be, still is probably in some cases, a house rule that said if at any point during the game, if my hand has no lands or nothing I can play, I can then like either shuffle it in and draw more cards. I can put it in the graveyard and draw more cards. I can do something like that. And those are not official rules. That is a house rule thing that some groups embraced, but according to the official rules of Magic, once the game starts, you're in. You can't just get rid of your hand and draw more cards because you don't like what you have in hand. And we have a question here from at slumber underscore spirit. What is the weirdest, most obscure, interesting MTG rules interaction you know? It's not the most complex thing in the world, but it's just cute. The, the card I, I will point to is a card called Faith's Fetters. It's an aura and it has enchant permanent, which means it can be attached to any permanent. Now, generally you put this on creatures because what the aura does is it stops them from attacking or blocking. It also stops their you know, abilities. Generally, this is a defensive aura that you're gonna put on things threatening you. So what you do is you get two of them and you put them on whatever. It doesn't matter what they're on to begin with. The important thing is, is Faith's Fetters says enchant permanent, which means you can use a card to move that aura onto a different permanent. So let's say I have Faith's Fetters 1, Faith's Fetters 2, doesn't matter what they're on. I'm gonna move Faith's Fetters 1, and that's a hard card to say. So it, the fact that I picked this tells you how much I love this interaction. And I'm gonna change it, I'm gonna move it. So it is enchanting Faith's Fetters number two. So now I have Faith's Fetters 1 enchanting Faith's Fetters 2 Enchanting something else doesn't matter. Find a spell, find a card that can move an aura. I'm gonna cast another one. And this time I'm gonna move Faith's Fetters 2. So it is enchanting Faith's Fetters 1. So now I have Faith's Fetters 1 enchanting Faith's Fetters 2. Faith's Fetters 2 enchanting Faith's Fetters 1. Why did I pick this card? Did I have to say 17 million times? I don't know, but I did. So now the two auras are attached to each other. They're hugging each other for life. They're sitting on a battlefield that is defined by chaos. Creatures are running past them at full speed in an effort to destroy other creatures and deal damage to your enemy. And these two face fetters are sitting there hugging each other, clinging to life. They have no ties to any other permanent. They have no connection to anything happening around them. They're just relying on each other for life, for safety, for security. And at the end of the day, isn't that what we're all doing? Just clinging to safety and security in life, finding another person or thing or people, I don't judge, whatever, but holding on to them? Isn't that what it's all about? Right there in your game of magic while you're throwing lightning bolts at your opponent's head and destroying all their creatures and stone raining their lands because you're some kind of jerk. But here are those Faith's Fetters holding on to each other. It's beautiful. It is a beautiful rules interaction. I'm sorry, what was your question? Let me look at it again. And we're done. Thank you so much for your questions. I had a blast. I hope you did too. This has been Magic the Gathering Support.